Danny Harvey to tell us all about how we're going to have human security with uh, handling our climate. Okay, well, thank you, Maida, for <coughs> organizing this overall series on security and for uh, inviting me to talk about global warming and its implications for two important elements of human security, food and water. Uh, let's see if I have the right button here. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So actually only part of my talk is going to be about food and water. Because I want to give you the latest news from the Arctic. Like by latest I mean a few days ago. Uh, I want to say something briefly about where we're heading. Okay, in terms of changes in climate. And then the latest, the last two or three years of assessments of the impacts or expected impacts on agriculture and water supplies of where we're heading. And I mean, basically, in a, in a nutshell, we're heading straight towards a cliff. The science is stronger than ever. And we're in a deeper state of denial, like our government is. Like, and you know, after the news last week in the article, there should be an emergency meeting of the cabinet to discuss what we should do to strengthen our climate policies. But since we have no climate policies, there's nothing to strengthen. So it's like, it's like as if it's a non-event, okay? So we are in a complete state of denial. And I was at a workshop in Aspen, Colorado, the Aspen Global Change Institute. I was actually the co-organizer of three, but I played the least role in actually inviting people. There were some really tremendous talks there on the psychology of denial and its relationship to the structure of the human brain. Uh, so I want to say a little bit of, the, of that, because this is like the last year or two of neuropsychological research. Um, and then I want to just briefly touch upon some ideas that I have on a strategy to go forward, given that we're heading towards a cliff, and given that the, the science is stronger than ever, and given that most people are in a complete state of denial. Okay. Um, so the latest news from the Arctic. So maybe we can actually dim some of these lights or turn them off. Right? I'd still leave something. Yes, OK. Um, so this is a graph showing this here. This is the normal um, seasonal variation in the extent of ice. Of course, the ice is maximal at the end of the winter. And then it retreats down to some minimal extent. And then it expands again, right? And this is the normal progression from June through to September, which is when you got to get the minimum. This is what it was in 2007, which up until this year was the lowest ice extent on record. And this is where we were, where we are up until now. Okay, we're here. <laughs> up until this year, <coughs> September, which set a new record uh, for minimum extent of sea ice. And this is what it looks like. So here in the early 80s, late 70s, we, we, you know, the ice would retreat down to about 8 million square kilometers, 7.5 million square kilometers. Okay. This September, 16th of September, this is what, 11 days ago, mm. we set the new low of 3.41 million square kilometers. And now it's beginning to grow again. We're moving into winter, fall and winter. So this is like a factor of two reduction, okay? Uh, Here's a map. This uh, pink, dark pink, was the normal extent in the 1980s. This was 2005, okay, which was already seemed like, wow, remarkable. Look how much it's retreated already. <laughs> and there's 2007, okay, which was the record until 11 days ago. Uh, and then, oh yes, of course, the, the paid liars. Okay, that go out and spread misinformation. We're telling us, oh, look, the sea ice has recovered um, in 2009, but it didn't really recover. All it did was return to the trend line. Okay, this is 2009. This is the so-called recovery of the sea ice, right? Uh, and then uh, there's where it was uh, 11 days ago. Okay, so now look at this. The, the latest. IPCC report, which came out in 2007, you know, which had some tiny little errors, right, which were made into a big uh, commotion. I, I, they actually have a bigger error. The bigger error is this one. 
they were projecting, right, that sea ice would not really, even, even 2000, 2100, there would still be some residual summer sea ice, right, or most likely, or possibly it could all be gone by 2100. Okay, this is where we are. Now people are saying, hey, you know, <laughs> the summer ice could be gone by 2030. Okay, so that's really remarkable news. Now, of course, what you're seeing is a feeding frenzy. Governments are now fighting and maybe even going over the war, going to war over dwindling, or you know, over the prospect of oil and gas in the Arctic. That's the that's how they see it. This is an opportunity to get more oil and gas. Not this is a warning that the climate system is far more sensitive than we realize. And big things with massive implications are happening. No, they don't see that at all. Right now, Greenland. 1983 and before, this was the amount of the area that would be subject to melting during the summer. I mean, a glacier, there's net accumulation in the center, net ablation, melting, exceeding accumulation on the sides, and the, and the ice flows from the net accumulation zone to the net ablation zone. And purple is was the zone with uh, melting, some at least one day of melting during the summer. But then as the climate has been warming, progressively more and more of Greenland was subject to at least one day of, of surface melting. Okay, so this is by 2005. Does anyone know, did anyone hear what happened this summer with Greenland? Does anyone know? No one heard? Big time. Yeah, we heard what happened. Well, just water everywhere. Well, yeah, it went from that to 97 percent. Yeah. This is uh, this was the area subject to melt on July 8th of this summer. Okay, this is the area that was subject to melt on July 12th of this summer. Okay, uh, they measure why well, they detect water through various um, spectral signatures in the radiation that is emitted or or that our solar radiation that's reflected. Um, and they have three different satellites that are um, measuring different properties of the surface. Um, and these are areas where only one of the three indicated that melting was occurring. These are areas where two or three out of three indicated that melting occurred, okay? So that is also dramatic news that should be leading to an emergency meeting of Parliament and Congress and all the other legislatures in the world, you would think. Um, because you know, if we lose Greenland, now it's not going to happen anytime soon. But you know, eventually, it's six meters sea level rise, and that could be in 600 years. That could be a meter per century for six centuries from Greenland alone. Okay, you know, that floods all the major coastal cities in the world. Um, okay, so now where are we heading? Uh, okay, so here's the temperature record. The climate is getting the temperature is getting warmer. That is an established fact. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, that warming is unusual. Okay. Um, you see, we only have a thermometer record of sufficient density to form a meaningful global average back to about 1856. But we can extend that record with proxy data, primarily tree rings, but not only. Okay. And so various people have reconstructed temperature variations over the last millennium uh, is either northern hemisphere or a global average mean. Um, different approaches give different wiggles, okay? But they all agree that there was a gradual downward cooling of about one or two tenths of a degree uh, from 11, from 1080 to 1900. And then this warming the last hundred years, 0.8 degrees sticks out. There's no scientific doubt that this is primarily due to human emissions of heat trapping gases. Okay? You put a sweater on, you're going to get warmer. You trap heat, the, plant, the climate is going to get warmer. And there's no law of physics whereby that can't happen. Okay? So, and solar variability won't cut it. That's been shown over and over again. There are outright lies being propagated that, you know, it was just as warm during the medieval period as it was, as it is now, or warmer still. 
that's just not true, okay? There's no, no evidence to support that. Individual regions may have been warmer, but that would be due to shifts in ocean currents or winds, which means they're taking heat <coughs> from one place and moving it somewhere else, cooling here, warming there, departures from the average, okay? So these are the only these are the scientifically credible, peer-reviewed, okay. I mean, anybody can publish any junk reconstruction in a junk journal that doesn't have scientific peer review processes. You know, you, you guys know better than to pay any attention to that. Okay? Now, the factor tending to cause the climate to warm is the trapping of infrared radiation, so-called heat, okay, by so-called greenhouse gases. This trapping is called a forcing, okay? It depends on the changes in concentration, which we can measure, okay? And the radiative properties of the gases, which we can also measure in laboratory experiments. So these are both known, okay? So that can be calculated, okay? And we can calculate what that, what, you know, where we're heading, okay, by 2100. And then we can estimate from geological data uh, isotope data, there's like an incredible array of geological indicators and evidence that has been pieced together now, giving us a pretty good picture of variations in greenhouse gas concentrations back several hundred million years. And what we find, oh, okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Here's the variation in CO2 over the last 400,000 years, okay, as measured in bubbles and ice cores. And here's where it's going, okay? Now, back of the envelope, observationally grounded uh, calculation will tell you we're going to three or four times CO2 by the end of the century. If we burn all the fuel that we think we're gonna burn over that time period, fossil fuel, okay? And then you can, so now this, here the scale is different. This is going back in time, okay? And this is a reconstruction of the so-called forcing over the last 45 million years compared to where we can project it will be under business as usual, okay? The point is 45 million years ago, there was no ice anywhere on this planet, okay? So you don't need to argue about anything else. We're moving in towards a heat trapping, a forcing, that puts the atmosphere into a state corresponding to the last time, at time when there was no ice anywhere on this planet. The last time the atmosphere was in this state, there was no ice anywhere on this planet, okay? So I think that's dramatic enough. And this doesn't depend on I mean, it's impossible to imagine this, this wouldn't have massive implications. First of all, sea level. If, you, if all the ice goes, you know, we're talking, we're, we're talking 60, 70, 80 meters sea level rise. Um, and massive changes in weather patterns and rainfall patterns. Um, but of course, it would take, I, I don't want to imply that the ice would all go, right, in 100 years. But what I'm saying is we're getting to the heat trapping, okay? You know, the last time, you, if you persisted, okay, eventually, if the past is any guide, you know, all the ice will go. It would take thousands of years, okay? But still, a meter a century indefinitely for many, many centuries, that's still bad news, okay? So now, um, looking just to the, 2100, you know, we can very confidently project three to six degrees warming under business as usual. Okay, that's big. Okay, okay, now, projected impacts. Now, this, this is alarming, okay? So I don't wanna depress everybody or make you feel, I'm gonna talk about your emotional reactions later. Okay, <laughs> so let's just let me throw it on the table and then let's talk about how we react emotionally. <laughs> and what we do about that, okay? Because uh, it's the people outside whose emotional reaction that you have to be really concerned about. Okay? Yes, okay. So, um, 
So, okay, so projected impacts on food production. First, let me take an a look at, this is an assessment of what the changes in climate that have occurred already are estimated to have done to world food production. So this means, of course, there have been, I mean, food production is going up. I mean, you look at yields of corn in Iowa, you know, now compared to 1900, I mean, it's six times higher or something like that, okay? Because of breeding and technology and practices and fertilizer use and so on and so forth, right? Um, so it's a question of untangling from this upward trend, what is the effect of the change in climate alone? So this is an, as an attempt to estimate that with uncertainty bars. Okay, so maybe there's been no effect on corn in China. Okay, the error bar, wait a second, let me read this right. In most regions, I think this, this would be the error bar. Yeah, this is the central estimate and this is the error bar range. Okay, so, you know, according to this estimate, you know, corn yields in China uh, are probably 7% lower. Okay, they've gone up, but they're 7% lower than they would have been otherwise. Or in Brazil, they're 8% lower. Or you look at rice in China, maybe it's actually had a slight benefit. Rice in India may be down 1% or 2%, okay? Uh, soybeans in Brazil, they grow a lot of soybeans in Brazil. Um, you know, maybe that's down 4% or so, okay? So this is the first study I'm aware of that actually is showing an impact already, and it's generally, it's small but adverse, okay? And it's driven by these changes in, in growing season temperatures. Okay, this is the warming from the period 1980 to 2008. Um, as, a, as a multiple of the year-to-year -year standard deviation. And so, you know, when the warming is three times the standard deviation, that's a pretty significant warming, um, as it is in most of Europe there and China, parts of China. Um, and these are the changes in moisture. It's been getting drier uh, in northern China, but wetter in the south, and similarly, north, dry, northern India dry, and much of Europe and Southern Russia has been drying, okay? Uh, okay, now, until recently, assessments of the impact of global warming on agricultural yield were based on monthly or daily mean temperature changes, and I think mostly monthly changes, okay? And did not consider changes in daily temperature extremes. A recent assessments taking extremes into account uh, indicate worse effects than previously estimated. Okay, and so it's non-linear, okay? This is showing uh, the impact on yield of, let's say, one day with a temperature of 30 degrees or 35 or 40 or so on, okay? And so you can see if you're adding days with temperatures in the, you know, up to about 25 degrees, you're increasing the corn yield, but if you're starting to add days to your growing season that are hitting 30, 35 or so, you're decreasing the yield, okay? So it's the frequency of those extreme days within the month that may not show up in the monthly average, okay? So this is uh, Schlenker and Roberts published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, okay, and this is the distribution of daily temperature highs in the corn growing regions of the US today. So what you'll do is shift this distribution, okay, this probability distribution, and you might still, for a, for a small shift, you might be still mostly adding days in this region, but as you go higher, okay, you're starting to add more days in this region where you get adverse impacts, okay? And then this is the same thing uh, for soybeans and for cotton. And so you can see, once you start getting temperatures above, um, frequently above 28, right? Temperatures, daily highs of 28 or higher have an adverse impact, right? For soybeans and for cotton, it's maybe, the zero line is at about 32 degrees, okay? Um, 
Okay, so taking that into account and doing a simulation that looking at day by day extremes and taking these nonlinearities that you saw in that previous graph into account, these are the projected changes in U.S. crop yields by for the 30-year period 2020 to 2049. So that's not too far off compared to 1960-89. Okay, so these are for four different emission and radiative forcing scenarios. Um, and this is for a particular computer model developed at the Hadley Center in the UK. Um, okay, so now this is looking at only the, okay, yeah, this also includes changes in precipitation, but not, not adaptation, okay? So this is before adaptation, okay? So this is like the direct effect of the changes in climate. And so you can see for corn, for these high emission scenarios, higher warming, we're talking 25 or 30 percent reduction. Soybeans, maybe 20 percent. Cotton, 20 percent or so. Now that's a small enough a, a reduction. I'm sure adaptation uh, and adjustments can handle reductions and mitigate, offset reductions that big. So like 20 percent, that's not an issue. Um, but this, uh, these are the projections for 2070 to 2099, and now we're talking, you know, 60 to 70 to 80 percent likely losses in corn yield. Okay, now maybe adaptation will cut that in half. Like we shouldn't underestimate the potential of adaptation. It, it, it is significant, but these are also a significant a significant primary driver. Okay, and soybeans, right, is also equally almost equally uh, adversely affected. Okay, this exhibit is showing the change in the number of months of drought for the 30 year period in the middle of this century compared to the last century, okay? Based on changes in precipitation only. So you take these computer models and take their future precipitation compared to the present precipitation, but use present temperatures, okay? And so this is uh, number of drought months. So this is, this is 30 years of 12 months, so it's sort of 360 um, months. So look at this is, you know, we're talking one third of your months becoming drought months, an increase by to one third of all those months, okay? And this is uh, taking into account the warmer temperatures, which increase soil evaporation, which increase in water losses, okay? So this is one country where they, you would think people ought not to be in denial, okay? Because it actually looks pretty bad uh, for the southern U.S. and Texas and the, the whole, this, well, Central America, we'll see, and the southwestern U.S. Now, here are some estimates of return periods for drought. You take a drought that currently is so severe it only occurs once, at, once every 100 years, or would be expected once every 100 years. Uh, there'll be many regions where that 100-year drought will be occurring one year in 10, okay? Now, you know, we hear about the economic problems of yeah, Greece there, uh, and Italy, Spain, and possibly Portugal, right? These are nothing, right? I mean, that's just a money problem, a paper problem. But, you know, this is, this is a much more serious problem because, you know, Turkey, Southern Europe, right, are projected to be really hard hit. Um, and now this is Africa, projected impacts by mid-century on African staples. Uh, so we have maize, sorghum, millet, groundnuts, and cassava. These are pretty substantial, okay, 20, 30% mean estimated losses. Um, yeah, actually, this is the, the anticipated impact from temperature changes alone, 
and the impact from precipitation changes the loam. So the overall impact is driven by the projected warming. Now you think Russia, of all countries, Russia should benefit from, Russian agriculture should benefit from a warmer climate, right? But where is most of Russia's agriculture, right? Mm -hmm. It's here, okay? The southern part and then the Ukraine is here, okay? These are, these are the dry parts of the country and they're projected to get drier as it gets warmer, okay? This says current water stress in Russia as indicated by the ratio of water withdrawal in 1995 to the availability of water average. So availability is averaged over that period and I'm looking at withdrawal in one year. Uh, from wells or something? Uh, well, no, I think we're from rivers or from whatever. You've got a river, you take water out of it, there's less water, right? So, you know, the water, the rivers, by the time they reach the Black Sea, you know, it's like the Colorado River at times literally is, becomes dry. There's no water flowing into Mexico at times, okay? It didn't used to be that way, okay? Uh, but it is now from time to time. Okay, so this is uh, today. And then this says the change in the availability of water by the 1970s. So they're projecting, so really it's these areas here, okay? This is one model. I think this is the optimistic model. Let's see what the next results look like. That's the Hadley Center model. And yeah, this is the German model, Echan. Okay, so it's less, so it's like Russian roulette. Maybe you'll be lucky in lose 5%, maybe you won't, you'll lose 25%, okay? So at any rate, now when you see where most of Russia's food production is, it's in the already dry, already vulnerable. I mean, it doesn't really do much good to get warmer up here. Okay? The soils are lousy. Okay? You're not gonna grow anything there anyway. Um, okay, now this is grain production in China. Um, and if you were noticing the sources, they're all from papers in very good journals in the last two or three years. Impacts on grain production in China in 2020 and 2040 for an, oh yes, I read the paper. I looked at how big, of, how much climate change are they projecting? Not very much, okay? So it's really for an optimistic projection of climate change or they have this climate change and they're assuming very optimistic assessments of the beneficial physiological effects of higher CO2, what's called CO2 fertilization. Or, okay, so let's see if we figure out which one is which here. Um, okay, yeah, so this is, this is climate change alone. So climate change, the modest climate change that's projected for 2040 is is expected to have a slight, give a slight boost to Chinese food production. Um, if you take a modest climate change and a really positive, strong CO2 fertilization effect, it gives a bigger boost, okay? But then, if you take into account reduced availability of water due to increasing urban and industrial demands for water, hmm? Now the situ the, the, you know, it's not, you see, the bigger impact on food security and water supply in China are these other non-agricultural demands on the water. So that brings it down. And then, let's see. Uh, fourth is climatic change. Oh, okay, this is, oh, this is climatic change without the CO2 benefits. This is climatic change, CO2, and water availability. Okay, and then uh, loss of land due to, oh yeah, these are impacts on grain production. Loss of land due to urbanization, okay. Uh, let's see, climatic change, right, and then everything in, or again, without CO2 fertilization, and then this is with it, okay. So the message here is that other factors besides climate, in the near term, when the climatic changes are still small, um, are appear to be more important for grain production in China. Okay, but 
Unfortunately, this doesn't go beyond 2040. So when we're looking at bigger climatic changes, um, I haven't found anything up to date that I would want to show you. Uh, okay, now this is a synthesis from another paper, 2010. It says, estimate of the impact on crop production left and international prices, right? Uh, uh, okay, again, we're only looking at 2030, right? <laughs> where it's way, way more warming continues on to 2100 and on into the next century. But uh, this is, so the wor this is like worst case and best case, okay? The worst case has a high change in climate, a high sensitivity of crops to changes in climate, and low CO2 fertilization benefits, so that gives you this, if you have a small climate change, a small sensitivity or effect of the climate on the crops, and a, and a very optimistic CO2 fertilization, you get these curves up here. Okay, so this gives sort of the range of risks. And again, we're seeing South African maize, U.S. maize, um, Central African here, okay. These are significant losses, and this is only 25 years from now. No, 15 years from now. Oh, wow, well, okay, 18 years from now. And then wheat in the US and China. Okay, so obviously then these have big impacts for human security. If you don't have food, you don't have water, right? Um, your survival is at stake, you're not secure. Well, actually, I have more. I have some stuff now on water. And what time is it? Oh, okay, I'm going to finish at the end if I can. Okay, so but first we should understand that many parts of the world are subject to pretty severe water stress already today. Um, and this stress is again measured in the withdrawal to availability ratio. And so, you know, anything that's various shades of brown, okay, is already. Uh, in an area of water stress uh, today. Okay, and population is growing most rapidly in many of those brown areas, and the climate is going to get warmer. Evaporation is going to increase. Now, one of the issues is that many parts of the world depend on, for summer water supplies, they depend on either glacier melt okay or they depend on snow that accumulates seasonal snow that accumulates and then melts okay so everything there circled in that red line that is in blue uh, is dependent on winter snowfall or glacier melt now with the climate getting warmer glaciers are melting so it's actually never been better <laughs> in terms of glacial fed water flow but river flow. But when the glaciers finally are completely gone, okay, now that's that spigot is, tur is turned off. If rain, if precipitation increasingly falls as rain in the winter instead of snow, it doesn't accumulate to then be released during the spring and early summer. It runs off in the winter and it doesn't do any good. Unless you can build big reservoirs and dams, um, but in many of these areas here, there isn't, you know, you can't store a lot of water um, to tide you through the summer. Okay, so there's a, you know, irrespective of what happens to precipitation, just the warming itself, which is the, you know, when it comes to global warm climate change, it's warming, we know that, okay? But the precipitation changes, that's the uncertain part, okay? But this doesn't depend on the on certain part, this, this we can see happening uh, from the more certain part. Okay, so glaciers are retreating. Uh, you know, in the IPCC, there was a little tiny mistake. Uh, it was a typo, I think, when they were copying something. They said Himalayan glaciers would be gone by 2035, uh, which, if you think about it, it's not really possible. They're melting, but they're not gonna go that fast, but anyway, uh, and there was a slight error in the amount of, uh, there was a statement about how much of the Netherlands is below sea level. 
it said 60% and I think it's 40% or something like that. So on the basis of that, you know, we just have to throw out the whole IPCC report. It's like, is there anything we, we can believe in what they had to say? Um, but the point is glaciers are retreating and you know, one by one they'll disappear and once they disappear, that's turning off that spigot, okay? Uh, here's some data on you know, retreat, linear retreat in the termini of some of these glaciers in the Himalayas. Um, okay, so now here are some maps of projected changes in river runoff. Okay, so this is the balance between changes in rainfall uh, versus increases in evaporation. Okay. Uh, it's the difference between those two is what runs off. Okay, so the picture here is like different computer models give different specific, and they all give warming, right? And they all give a lot of warming, but they differ in the regional details. Okay, although there are certain commonalities. I mean, generally, you know, in the Middle East and the Mediterranean and uh, southern U.S., and uh, yeah, are, are out, yeah, I mean, in every one of these maps, you know, northern India, middle, right through to Spain, right? It's generally getting drier and there's less water, okay? There's some disagreement as to what happens in the Amazon. So either the Amazon makes it or it doesn't in terms of surviving as an ecosystem. Um, I mean, that's another topic is the biodiversity impacts we're just talking about food and water here, but anyway, there's the general picture. Um, so there's going to be less water available, okay? At the same time, it's hotter, and, and population is still growing in many of these parts of the world. Now, this one here, this is, says number, numbers of people in different regions in 2050 experiencing an increase in the top or decrease in water stress. Water stress, I guess, is if you have less than a thousand cubic meters per person per year. Okay, and that would include for agricultural and all purposes, based on climate projections by these same four models. Now you see, actually, in every single one of these, there's northern China um, either has no change or gets more water. Okay, and actually parts of India well, certainly in this one, and in this one, not in that one. But there are some regions in some models where there's actually going to be a reduction in water stress. So it's moving things around, right? So there's actually large numbers of people where that are going to benefit from the water shifting to their region, uh, and large numbers of people that are going to suffer because of a reduction of water supply in their region. I mean, evaporation goes up everywhere, but range Rain belts are shifting, right? So if the rain belt shifts to your region and you didn't have the rain belt before, you're gonna have more rainfall. You may see an increase in water supply in spite of the increase in evaporation, okay? So, but you can see we're talking large numbers of people, hundreds of millions affected one way or the other. So this could have a potentially very destabilizing so then here's the synthesis. This was published in the last IPCC assessment. So various shades of orange and red are the losers, and various shades of blue are the winners. And so you can see the Mediterranean, Middle East, and uh, southern and southwestern US and most of Central America are the consistent losers in southern Africa and other, a few other areas. Okay, so now I want to, even though this isn't really directly related to security, <laughs> it's related to dealing with it psychologically. And because I, these were some great, um, I'm going to give you some highlights from some truly fantastic presentations. Uh, and some of the background papers that were made available at this workshop in Aspen last May. Uh, 
Um, so first of all, we have to understand a little bit the human brain. Okay, now I'm not an expert on this, but I really recommend this article by William Reese, Bill Reese. This is a um, sustainability science practice and policy. I assume it is an open access journal, I'm not sure, but try to get it, and if you can, Google William Reese or email him and ask him for it. This is one of the best papers on the whole subject of sustainability and our denial of what we're doing. This is absolutely a fantastic paper. Anyway, in that paper, he lays out these three different parts of the human brain. There's the reptilian complex. Now this, of course, is a classification that not all neuropsychologists would necessarily accept, but Reese argues that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that these things have some reality, although you know, what, the way we function is an integration to varying degrees of these. But anyway, there's the so-called reptilian complex concerned with auto autonomic responses, like or functions like circulation and breathing, and instinctive social behavior, and hardwired ritualistic behavior, and I would also say hardwired ideologically driven you know, some of our ideological beliefs do become hardwired in the brain. And sort of the reactions to ideas, just like you have a reflex or you learn a sport and you build reflexes, we, certain patterns of thinking become hardwired. And they can be overcome, but it's, it's not easy. Uh, the reptilian complex also governs this, or is related to this fight or flight response. When you're confronted with danger, Right? You either fight or run, right? Fight or flight, the fear reaction. Then there's the limbic system, or I think some people will call it the mammalian system. The primary seat of emotions, happiness, sorrow, pleasure, pain, personal identity, who we are, our sense of who we are, our affective, that is emotion-charged memories, and it also seems to be the seat of value judgments and informed intuition. And then there's the neocortex, which is like um, two-thirds of our brain by volume, okay? Um, but often subordinate to these other two parts, unfortunately. The seat of consciousness, the locus of abstract thought, and the part of the brain that makes us capable of moral judgment and forward planning, among many, many other things. Okay, now, how do people react to the news about global warming. Well, it could be fear and helplessness, uh, apathy, like, can't do anything about it, we'll just pray. <laughs> Defiance, you deny it, you just refuse to believe it. Guilt or anger, okay? And this is from one of the Aspen workshop presentations by Jeff Keel, which was absolutely one of the highlights of the conference. Okay. Now, okay, so what are our fear reactions? Well, we could have fear of the consequences, and that could cause us to deny it, or we could have fear of what would have to be done to deal with it if it were true. And I think most of the denial stems from fear of what it means for us and our lives and what we have to do and how we have to change right now. Because obviously we have to change because our current collective path is leading to disaster, so something has to change, right? That's, that's self-evident. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people fear, and that puts them into states of denial. Now, this is incredible. This is hot off the press. Uh, you know, they can now measure the size and mass of different parts of the brain that are associated with these different functions, okay, and different reactions. And at the same time, they can do surveys to find out if these people fall as liberals or conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> and what they found is conservatives have a bigger amygdala, in particular a right amygdala, okay? The right amygdala is part of that reptilian complex. <laughs> it is responsible for this fear reaction, okay? And look, at conservatives have been more afraid of Russians and the Soviets and nuclear weapons. I mean, and they tend to be more aggressive in their response to perceived fears. 
okay? The part of the brain that we know governs fear is observed to be bigger in people that we observe to be conservatives. <laughs> this paper, Current Biology, I recommend taking a look at it for the actual data. Okay, on the other hand, people who are classified as liberals in terms of their answers to surveys. This is American definition of liberal? Well, um, yes, I guess so. Well, this is actually young. This paper is very, they're not saying this applies, in fact, to the entire population. It only applies to young adults, which are mainly university age. I think that was the sample, was university age, and maybe even university students. So, you know, it's actually very cautious, and you can even see in the title of the article, it's not necessarily saying this applies to the entire population. A lot more research is going to have to be done. And I'm sure, like, the American Free Enterprise Institute and these other right-wing neoliberal um, uh, institutes are going to want to be doing their own studies <laughs> very soon to see if these results can be uh, replicated. But liberal is not the same in Canada as it is in the States, for instance. Oh, I and agree. Elsewhere. Yeah, I agree. You know, our, we, you know, Americans would consider liberals still not too far from communists. <laughs> <laughs> Canadian liberals. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, anyway, in American liberals, okay, the, um, the interior cingulate cortex tends to be bigger than it is in conservatives. And this is a part of the brain associated with handling risk and uncertainty. And global warming deals with, you know, is handling, handing people a lot of risk <coughs> and uncertainty, okay? And, you know, liberals are willing to accept uh, things other than black and white, you know, that ambiguity, that range of possibilities, on the one hand this, on the one hand that. Conservatives have simple-minded solutions to complex problems. This is what we need to do, just lower taxes, right? Or get government off our back, right? That'll solve the problem. Or nuke them. Right? So um, anyway, I just thought this was pretty interesting, pretty dynam dynamite uh, uh, information. It's hilarious, but it's also dangerous if somebody took it seriously. <laughs> Well, we understand, okay, look, there's enough caveats, okay? Um, you know, you could, and it's a statistical relationship. You could be a, you could have a big amygdala and still be very liberal, okay? Um, this isn't direct causal, it's a statistical relationship, but I mean, I think if we're approaching certain people, you know, they may be hardwired to react in a way that involves fear. So. What we need to do then, I mean, the, the lesson I take from this is we have to understand people's fears, okay? And then we have to, and I may, maybe didn't do it in this audience, but this is a different group. We have to present especially the solutions, right? Because I think that's where most of the fear comes from, in a way that isn't going to elicit fear. So again, from this Aspen workshop, from Jeff Keo's presentation, uh, what are some of the fears that might be elicited okay, in global warming deniers? Well, I ch uh, the fear of a loss of faith. The, you know, the prospect of global warming to some people, particularly in the US where there's more of a fundamentalist religious tradition, I mean, this is a challenge to their religious belief. It means God is not in charge. God is not taking care of things. No, no. Okay. No, it means it's the end of the world. So, um, the hell with it. <laughs> well, okay. I'm going to show you. Okay, I'm going to quote here. Let me. I don't know. This is this is Janice, Senator James Inhofe. Okay. Um, why he doesn't or his religious argument why global warming has to be a pile of bunk. Okay. Genesis 8, verse 22, which says, as long as the earth remains, there will be springtime and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night. So this is interpreted as meaning the earth could not, the climate could not be changing as a result of anything humans are doing. Okay, 
My point is God is still up there. The arrogance of people to think that we, human beings, would be able to change what he is doing in the climate is to me outrageous. Okay? This, is in two, this statement was made in 2012, not 1812, by the way. Okay? Today, okay? This is what a lot of... There's some truth in that. I mean, we are not in control of the weather. Yes, we can... Yes, definitely adding CO2 adds carbon dioxide, but we don't know who's going to get poured on and who's going to get... Yes, that's true, but that's governed by laws of physics. Okay, which, I mean, we're, we're changing things and causing a cascade of effects that are governed by the laws of physics. It just so happens the system is so complicated Right, that we cannot ever possibly predict in detail what's going to happen. Okay? Mm -hmm. But whatever is happening is happening because of observable laws of physics. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, so there's a challenge to religious beliefs. It makes some people. Now, there's another religious community which responds quite differently, and I, I'm going to talk about that later, okay? But for some, Okay, for some religious communities, this is a challenge to their faith. Okay, um, there's a fear of government control, and Americans especially, I mean, like they just hate government, okay, any kind of government. Um, and the truth is, and you know, what's her name? Naomi Klein wrote an excellent article uh, earlier this year, you know, coming up, you know, we've got to confront reality. I mean, that dealing with global warming is a threat to American capitalism. Okay, it is a threat to the uh, everyone for himself, free market, get rich mentality. It's a threat to that. There's no question about it. Okay, so for those who like that system, okay, it is a threat. Okay, so you know we have to deal with people's fear of government control, and so then the question is mechanisms policy levers and how to go about creating the conditions that you can still have a competitive quasi-free market or free market situation with um, still room for initial individual initiative. But this is a, a, I think this is a big part of big fear, okay? Loss of government, loss of freedom. I mean, just in the last few days, right, I was reading, um, you know, Obama, Wants and what has been acted? What's on the books right now are regulations to, to require a doubling in the fuel efficiency of the automobile fleet by 2030. Okay, which the science and the technology says, you know, that can be done. Okay, so just do it. Okay, so Obama is doing that. He's got good scientific advisors. Okay, um, you know, Mitt Romney's response is if he's elected, you know, that's off the books because. Um, is re reducing people's choice and it's going to cost them more money up front, although it'll save them many times the incremental cost. But it's this issue that I should be free to do whatever I want, irrespective of the consequences. Right? Uh, perceived threat to the economy, um, the threat to the fossil fuel industry is definitely a threat to the fossil fuel industry, but you know, they could diversify. Okay? They could diversify, they don't keep their heads in the sand. Um, threats to established habits, you have to change what you're doing, and that means you're changing your identity, right? If you, you know, I mean, how does it go? People act the way they perceive themselves. Like if, I'm a, if I perceive myself as an environmentally conscious, then I will act this way. I don't um, call myself environmentally conscious because I act that way, because I, or rather I act that way because I'm classifying myself as this, right? So now if you're asking people to change their habits, you're asking them to change their self-identity, right? And that, that um, provokes a fear reaction as well. Okay, so I said that already. So anyway, I just want to finish. In light of all of this, and this is really quick and dirty, but, um, we have to present solutions, which hasn't even been part of my talk. Okay, that's a whole other talk. But you know, the various solutions involve energy efficiency and changes in taxation and government regulations, where, where there's a sound case for government regulations. 
and redesigning cities and transit and a whole bunch of other things. We have to present solutions in a way designed to as provoke as little fear as possible. Okay? And then I think um, that you know there's a real opportunity to engage the religious community, not the one I was talking about before, but the other religious community, um, by specifically appealing to the ethical dimensions. Okay? Which in other in some people may um, um, invoke provoke rather feelings of guilt but you know there's a religious community that says we have an ethical demand an ethical obligation it's God's requirement that we care for other human beings right and that we care for other species that are part of God's creation it's God did not create this world for us to trash okay that's a central belief of a significant religious, more of the mainstream religious communities and the mainstream churches. And even some of the ev evangelicals are now starting to see that, you know, there's this stewardship obligation, okay? And my, I, I haven't been very scientific about this, but from reading these, you know, there's this uh, series of reports that comes out every few months or a year, or every year from Yale University. There's this I forget what the name of the project is. It's just Lacerovich or someone um, does surveys and analyses of public opinions and perceptions on global warming. And just glancing over that, it seems to me that you know we've got about 15% of the population on board. Like there's 15% that would regard them that in survey in responses to surveys say so, you know they're very concerned and they think there should be serious action taken to deal with it. The problem is no politician can get elected with 15%, okay? But if, and I think especially in the US where, it's, where people tend to be more religious, if you can pull in another 15%, right, of the, relig more, the, the more religiously motivated and bringing in these ethical dimensions, okay, if we bring them on board, then we've got 30%, and I would su submit that if you've got 30%, behind you, you can get it done, right? Because, first of all, 60, you know, with only 60% voting, right? And, you know, it's those swing votes, right? So, because uh, right now governments at the national level are in this country, okay, and in the U.S. because of the, the Congress, you know, really are not going anywhere, okay? I mean, Obama can only do what he can do that doesn't require congressional approval which is limited, okay? So I, you know, I'm a believer that, you know, you don't have to convince anywhere close to the majority of people. You have to get a large enough mass that you can get elected, right, and re-elected, right, the politicians that will do the things that are needed. And we have to, we need a good communication strategy for the other 70% uh, of the population. The other thing is, there's 15 or 20% or 25%. It doesn't matter what you do. You can be talk to your blue in the face. You will never convince them. Okay, And it might be that they're just hardwired. right? They're hardwired. So we recognize that's another conclusion I draw from some of this. Is some people, you know, the Tea Party type, right? I, I wouldn't even try to convince them. Right? But we don't need to. Right? I hope I don't sound like Mitt Romney. <laughs> <laughs> I still care for them. <laughs> okay, and if I'm president, I'm, I'll be their president. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Two whammies, the trauma consciousness model of the U.S. drought, yeah. and then the Cox Brothers science advisor saying we're involved. Where do you think that, uh, or rather, where do you think that moves the ball? Well, I'm not aware of how this drought in the U.S. is affecting public uh, 
opinions right now. Maybe you could fill us in on that. Well, it's up to, I think, the worst in 50 years and 50% of their counties. So there's the economic impact, yes. the economic losses, the yeah. visual. Yeah. Uh, you know what, Australia moved to a climate uh, legislation because of the trauma model. Uh -huh. The floods in the north, the fires in the center, the drought in the south. Yes. Like I don't wish it on people and yes. I hope that's not what we need, uh -huh. but it does get people's attention it when you're getting does. whacked up yeah. uh, repeatedly. So I, I'm not aware at all of what the American opinions are right now on that drought. Is it being... Uh, Put up as a warning, or as an as, a, as an early impact of global warming, or how is it being interpreted or discussed in the media? Well, I think people are very aware of it. Yeah, it's, just, um, it's been. I mean, it's been reported. Yeah. So, yeah. Actually, it's going to show up in the uh, in the uh, grocery store already. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or, or fears that it's going to even impact more. So that's uh, yeah. that's a reminder. Well, I just forgot to say one thing. Um, we could easily um, um, absorb the worst impacts that I showed here and still feed everybody if we all became vegetarian, okay? Because um, the efficiency in providing megajoules of food energy to humans from plant matter through animals is 4%. If you look at the energy content of all the biomass fed to animals, okay, versus the energy content of the final delivered animal products, the ratio one to the other is 0 0.04. So it's 4% efficiency. Okay? The efficiency of processed vegetable and, and fruit uh, products and plant products is 70%. If you're eating raw fruits and vegetables, of which I actually eat a lot, okay, that's 100%, okay? So if you're having a mixture of processed vegetable products and raw, unprocessed, you know, maybe your efficiency is 80% versus 4%. So like that's a factor of 20, okay? So there's no, you know, we have the possibility. now. So the question is, will the rich continue to eat meat uh, while the poor are starving? Or will they give up their meat um, so that the food doesn't need to be fed to animals? That will happen to some extent automatically because the price of beef is going to go up more than the price of tofu, okay, in relative terms. Because, and so then what will happen is cattle will be slaughtered. There will be less meat produced. And then that will absorb some of the. Um, so anyway, I just want to mention that in passing. You know, we we can still feed everybody. Nobody should die. Nobody needs to die. Of course, we don't live in an ideal world where people will die, unfortunately. Yes. I, I just want to announce that Science for Peace has a climate justice working group, and that our next meeting is on the Tuesday, the ninth of October. It will be on our website. Um, but I, I also had a few things, um, comments. Um, you know, there's, uh, I guess, one other aspect in terms of the, the threats of, um, to agriculture comes from sea level rise already, which is the, uh, you know, the salinization of, of uh, like the Nile and Mekong Delta, which are major fruit producing areas. So the, the threats are um, multiple, plus the, you know, the uh, unpredictable kind of um, effects like, uh, you know, the, you know, positive feedbacks and all that. Um, but, but another thing I think that the modeling um, leaves out, I mean, you alluded to the, the fact that the, the, the predictions about sea level, you know, sea ice were, were incorrect because it didn't take into account the observation. But I think that's the same in terms of the human world is that, um, you know, it's, it's it's difficult to think about what to do without considerable taking into account the geopolitical economic situation. Um, you know, the tremendous control of the food supply by a small number of companies, you know, the trade regulations that, that um, pretty much prevent 
um, local sustainable agriculture, for instance, and you know, in many countries, the land grabs that are occurring, the shift to biofuel, you know, um, you know, growing, growing biofuels and so on. You know, the, the, these are, are <coughs> all these things also are decimating the water supplies, you know, the uh, aquifers, so, the, so that the human caused threats, you know, to water, uh, um, you know, completely uh, aggravate the, and complement the, the, you know, well, that's what was aspects of the climate. Course. Chinese results was the impact of all these other withdrawals on water. They're huge. Yeah. And, and it's the same in Canada, it's the same in the United States. Um, I think the other thing in terms of, I mean, one of the things that I, in terms of psychology, you know, the, the, the is also important to take into account. And, and it's quite different. I think it's very difficult to make generalizations about people because, um, you know, there are certainly many people who have quite a good capacity to apprehend reality and, and uh, I was in I was in Guatemala about a month ago on the you know, public health tribunal you know around the mining companies and people there you know also talked right away about climate change that not only is there the impact of the Canadian extraction companies you know, which is, is terrible environmentally that people could say that, that it was complemented too by you know by the impact of climate change. So, and we know that, you know, the Inuit people have been observing, you know, climate change very realistically and accurately for years. So, you know, the, it, it's complicated. But one of the things that, that James Hansen <laughs> refers to and is, is difficulties um, amongst people who are, who are in a position of responsibility to, to disseminate information their own difficulties with with authority, you know, that that he gives a number of examples of, of um, you know being with other scientists who are very reluctant to take to take stands because other other scientists who have a lot of authority aren't taking those stands and so on. You know, here at the University of Toronto, I, I've noticed that for years that they haven't had his book, for instance, at, at the the library where they have many climate change, you know, deniers books. I, I think his, his book now is on one of the, you know, library systems, one, one, one of the libraries here. But, um, you know, so that there's a, a, a um, I think, an emotional disconnect amongst, you know, well, you people know. At, at the university level, too, about how profoundly serious this problem is and how um, you know, in their own work, whether it's in law or poli sci or whatever, they're not grappling with it. I think a lot of climate scientists <coughs> have taken a strong stand in terms of saying, this is what the science says, okay? There was a tremendous report prepared just before the Copenhagen meeting called the Copenhagen Consensus. It has like about 30 top scientists, and it was a warning, a stark warning, time to be released uh, just before the Copenhagen conference about, you know, an update since IPCC 2007 on what was happening, because a lot had changed already from 2000, from, you know, the writing of the IPCC report in 2006 to 2009, and, you know, all the major relevant uh, scientific bodies, like you know, the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society, the Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society, uh, the British Meteorological Society, and various geological societies, they've all released their position statements, ecological societies. So, you know, scientists, most scientists, I mean, I mean science is supposed to be completely trustworthy and objective, and so, scientists feel they should not meddle into saying what politicians should do. Okay, they, some say, you know, we need to reduce emissions. Some don't want, and in the IPCC, you can't say that, okay? You just lay the facts on the table, um, and that's necessary so that there can be no accusation of bias. You just lay the, you know, the scientists have to, uh, have to be as objective and impartial 
and then it's for other groups to take those scientific warnings and the scientific evidence, groups who play an advocacy role. So, but what's happened is a lot of scientists are saying the other groups and the uh, politicians, you know, they're not getting the message, oh, we need to be a little bit stronger, or, you know, to hell with accusations of impartiality. We're, <laughs> we're, we're screwed if we don't get going, I'll say what I want. And that's Jim Hansen, right, and a few others. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a personal decision, but um, I think it's good that there are many scientists who are actually have not said anything apart from just the raw science, because you need, you need all kinds and all groups. But they've said things by signing on uh, to these position statements, which are fairly strongly worded. Um, I prepared a report to the university, which is still working its way through with, as part of an, this university's environmental committee. And we're putting forward fairly stringent proposals for standards for new buildings. Um, and I opened that report with a summary of about 20, I, I think I put it in, the details in an appendix, but I, you know, going through the websites, I found out there's actually quite a lot, you know, every, every single major scientific body uh, with relevance to the global warming issue has issued a fairly strong and authoritative position statement on global warming. Yes. Thanks, Danny, for a brilliant overview of the issue here. Um, I have a few questions and comments to your strategies. You have solution strategies. You have uh, briefly mentioned technical means to reduce uh, consumption. That's one of many. Uh, you've also mentioned to reduce consumption by uh, becoming vegetarian. So consumption per person has to be reduced. Yes. Uh, but you haven't mentioned uh, um, the population question. Uh, you have to, yes. to, to reduce overall consumption, yeah. not yes. just by technology and consumption per person, yeah. but also the number of people. Yeah. I think it's a big issue. Well, absolutely. And I, and I think you have my book, and you probably know. I start up front with population and GDP per person. How, much, how many people are there, and how much stuff are we consuming? And I think we have to moderate both. Um, but population, the projections are going down. Uh, that's good news. Yeah. Then about um, the what is on there in your strategies. Um, you haven't said a word about the how. How can you convince religious communities? Oh yeah, no, no, well this wasn't... How can you get yeah. to the yeah. 15... Well, I know a guy in Alberta, and I've been working with this guy in Alberta in the uh, Department of Social Science or Sociology, who has quite a few connections with some of the major religious leaders, and he's organized some workshops, and I've given some, uh, one or two, I think twice I've given a presentation for him, and like I'm open to working with religious leaders because I think this is a major segment of the, a significant segment of the population we have to bring on board. The media have a strong influence this. Uh, yeah. How can we uh, get But you know media? what? The media is now becoming supplemented by, supplanted by social networks, right? The social, like, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all these ways that the younger people communicate amongst themselves instantaneously. I mean, the, you know, the media is becoming less and less important. I mean, even in countries where this, the media is controlled by the state, right? The word gets out about what's happening here or there. So, um, you know, there's these other, uh, we have to somehow get Facebook. Uh, what's his name, uh, Zetterberg. We have to get him on board. <laughs> Andrew Weaver actually sends around a lot on Facebook. Andrew Weaver? Yes. Yeah. He sends yeah. around a lot on Facebook. 
Yeah, but there has to be like a message every time you log into Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with links. <laughs> Actually, I've got a really good uh, news report here from the European Commission. On the 20th of September, they signed an agreement with China, and the first part of that agreement is to set up a carbon trading agreement with yeah. China. Yes. So, you know what, I work on the model. There's that 20% who haven't figured out climate is an issue, and then there are those who don't care. Yeah. They're not going to be the ones, you know what, I look at the market for wind. It is billions of dollars going into wind, yes. and where are the deniers in that equation? They're going, have a good day, and they walk away from them. Yes. You know, the, yeah. when I run into those who are, haven't figured it out as a challenge, I just have a good day. Yeah. Because if they haven't engaged by now, mm -hmm. they're not going to be part of the, they're yeah. not likely they're going to be part of the group of the solution. Yeah, that's why I, right? I'm saying we don't have to convince the hardcore 25% denier. No. How do we get to the politicians? Um, well, we have to... We have to money! <laughs> well, <that one's, laughs> that's my point, actually, because they listen to money. Yeah. They don't listen to science. Yeah. And you have a, an example is that uh, scientists have said years ago that the whole thing with biofuels is not a green fuel, it's a, a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the politicians haven't listened to the scientists, no. but they did listen to the agricultural lobby yeah. because there is money flowing. Yeah. And so they established with billions and more uh, the, uh, uh, the biofuels industry. And now um, there is talk about it in the United States, but uh, definitely in Europe, they want to establish a moratorium of suspending the legislated uh, biofuel addition to yeah. fuels. And you know, what a waste. It doesn't make sense to have biofuels in an inefficient car. You make the cars two times more efficient first, right? And then you convert to plug in but, hybrids. But the politicians don't listen to the scientists. No, no, that's the problem. They listen to the lobbies. Yeah. And that's essentially money speaking. Yeah. Well, people have to elect the right politicians to mobilize. You know, the evangelical community in the United States is large and it, it you know, it's a, it has a significant political influence if you can get them on board. You know, politicians, because there are swing states and there's, you know, it's, you only need to shift a few percent, goes from one to the other, from one color to the other. Yes. Could, could you talk a bit about how long various uh, interventions might take to turn things around? In other words, how long, I mean, is it too late to do it just by reducing carbon emissions? If, it's, yeah. if the reduction of carbon emissions is never going to be enough now, we have to do something else, uh, what kind of sequestration procedures yeah. would work and how long would it take? And then if even that's not going to be enough, what about various kinds of geoengineering things? Yeah. Can, can you give us some notion of the timeline involved in trying to solve this? Well, what I'm working on right now in my research is I'm constructing fairly detailed bottom-up scenarios on a global scale with you know 10 different regions in the world, looking at transportation, buildings, and industry, and agriculture as the energy demand drivers, I mean population wealth and so on, but computing, calculating energy demand, and then looking at how fast can we ramp up various renewables and renewables. And the conclusion I get, I come to is, I mean, I can identify what I think are, you know, if we really had the will, um, technolo technically and economically feasible combinations of measures that would get global emissions down 50, 60 percent below year 2000 levels by 2050, okay, and then continuing on down to zero by 2080 to 20, 2100, okay, and that stabilizes the CO2 concentration at about 450. It's about the, when you add in the other greenhouse gases, it's about a doubling of effective CO2 concentration, which if you held it, 
you know, could be very, very bad news. But then, well, you know, then we could consider sequestration by biomass, biochar, or soil carbon, or something like that. Um, and you know, that may pull out, or reforestation, you could pull out one or two billion tons of carbon a year. So if you pull out 100 billion tons, in the end, it's about a 25 part per million fall in CO2. So you're getting down to 425, 400. It would take a couple of centuries to get down to 350, which might actually be a safe long-term level. So then the question is, OK, we're going to warm up too much. We're going to warm up to the point such that if that warming persisted, Greenland would irre irreversibly melt. The question is, can we pull it down before it reaches the point of no return, okay? And I've been looking at some, there's some papers coming out recently, came out recently that, you know, look at scenarios like that. And, you know, one to 200 years overshoot, you know, you'd, you'd get some loss, but you wouldn't get beyond a certain point, because as the ice cap melts, it drops lower in elevation, and then it melts, it becomes irreversible. Um, but with only a hundred year overshoot, you might be able to, you get some loss, but you may not reach that point where it enters an irreversible decline. So there's always the risk that it will. So we're in a situation now where there's going to be losses, right? Uh, coral reefs, for example, some of the tropical rainforests. It's a question of damage control, trying to minimize the loss. And, you know, I think the next, I mean, if we were a truly enlightened species, you know, we would be going all out to reduce emissions, then we'd be going all out to sequester and pull carbon down, and we'd be putting a lot of money into research, into ecological restoration, and research in assisted adaptation of, of ecosystems to get them through, right, as many of them as possible, get them through the next couple of hundred years. And geoengineering, you know, it only is possible um, if you've capped CO2 at a fairly low level and emissions are already zero and you just want to, like if it turns out that this overshoot, 100 year overshoot, is actually going to push Antarctica into a state of no of irreversible collapse, I'm not Antarctica, I mean Greenland, or the West Antarctic ice sheet, then a temporary geoengineering to shield that ice sheet, you know, for the next hundred years as CO2 concentration falls back to safe levels, you know, that, that could be a viable. But of course, geoengineering as in place of reducing emissions, I mean, that would be just completely irresponsible. And I don't think that would be allowed to happen. People would just protest too much. But you you use then as if you do one first, then in time you do. Well, you got it. Why don't you do it all at once? Well, there's no point sequestering. I mean, okay, you could build up carbon for good in the soil wherever that makes sense. Um, but if you're not, I mean, I mean, yes, you could start them in parallel or as one is fully ramped up, then direct attention to the other. But you know, there's no point putting a lot of effort taking carbon out of the atmosphere if the emissions are still high. It's, e it's easier to prevent the emission in the first place. Yes? Um, I, think, I think I also see one of the realistic challenges being now that it's easier for people to say environmental uh, issues will be better handled by the government or leave it up to the scientists to seek alternative sources of energy. Yeah. If you ask people on, the, in, on a personal level, how many of them are willing to give up using their uh, hair dryer in the morning or switching off their air conditioners for the summer? Like, you know, even people who are environmental, environmentally friendly, they might not even be willing to sacrifice. Well. What you have to do is show people how, through a retrofit of their house, or 
okay, they can reduce the need for air conditioning by, you know, 50% or whatever um, with the same comfort and then show them that, you know, you can actually use a fan part of the time and have the same comfort. And by the way, the new air conditioners are going to be twice as efficient. So, you know, you multiply all those things together and you can get big savings mm -hmm. without sacrificing real comfort. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your hair dryer is irrelevant, but it's the car. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, if you can provide people viable alternatives to driving or provide them a car that goes twice as far or three times as far, mm -hmm. right, uh, you know, then, then it's not such a, such a big deal. But if you give them no alternatives, you tell them, you know, you're stuck in Mississauga or Brampton or Vaughan and you have no public transit and you, know, you don't want to wait, I don't want you to drive. No, you've got to give people alternatives first. Yes. Supplement to that question is uh, how difficult is it to get the population to reduce consumption? Uh, look at Greece, uh, where they're supposed to reduce their uh, consumption a bit, and they turn violent. Look at Spain, they, there's a revolution in, in the making there. And uh, I remember in, uh, in Rio, uh, Bush Senior said the American lifestyle is not negotiable. Yes. So I think there is a big resistance to go down in, in the lifestyle. Yeah. In the public. Well, we have to deal with. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. um, but if you can make a person happy, they can live with less. Yeah, I was just going to say, my answer is we've got to focus on the determinants of happiness. Um, and again, this is where I think religion, you know, I think what we need is we need people to become more spiritual. And by spiritual, I don't need necessarily mean religious. I mean, I was talking to a philosopher at the Aspen workshop and he defined, I said, okay, what, what, what would, how would you define being spiritual? And he said, well, actually, his wife is also a philosopher. He's actually thinking a lot about that. But the, the definition is something like disengaged self-reflection. OK? So we have to disengage from ourselves and reflect upon ourselves and think of what is important and what are the true sources of happiness. And you know, what are our relationships with other people and with other life? And think about things like that. And the problem is. And then there's this whole concept of mindfulness. And I'm, you know, I'm only vaguely familiar with it, but it's like just, yeah, we need to reflect more on uh, this bigger reality, okay? Whether you're an atheist or not, there's still a bigger reality than you, right? And you need to reflect upon that. So we need to promote, and we hope the religious communities can promote more of, and the philosophical communities can promote more of that kind of thinking. Yes? I just wanted to respond to the uh, comment about, about the, the austerity packages, I guess, in uh, Spain and, and Greece and elsewhere. But this isn't a question of lifestyle, they're being asked to accept less. If the people at the bottom of society are being asked to accept a degree of destitution, it's not just turning off a, an, an air conditioner. There's 50% unemployment among Spanish young people. Yeah. They don't have jobs. They don't have a future. And in Greece, uh, Germany apparently is insisting that Greece spend a huge amount of money on armaments. Uh, so it's a question of, as part of that, part of the money they get is going back to, to Europe to pay for armaments, yeah. uh, which they don't need, of course. But uh, if there's a lifestyle choice that could be made in this instance, it's it's of the top half of society, the rich part. And yeah. you see. Uh, that start, uh, the, the new Holland, the president of France, is saying, well, we're going to put a higher tax brackets on the rich. There, there's going to be a rebellion there, but it's not going to be in the form of strikes. It's going to be form of capital strikes. Mm -hmm. And in the states, and uh, you, you see the Republicans uh, pressing for more tax cuts for the rich. And the same is with Tim Hudak in the province of Ontario. So with lifestyle, it's it's those who actually have a lot that should be good enough, not those at the bottom of society. That's not, They're not the problem. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to say is, 
Yeah, I think we have to do where to deal with it. Do with less, but it's a question of rate of change and adaptation to that. The thing about this austerity is it's so sudden and so large, and as you said, affecting people at the bottom. It throws people out of work and it, it jumps the pensions too. Yeah. I was going to make the same point actually. It's considerable class differences in terms of uh, you know emissions. The Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives looked at um, in Canada, and I, I can't remember the exact figures, but it was like something like the top 10%, it was like 66% or something, of the emissions or something like that. Ian Angus wrote a very interesting book about population, and he gives the example of um, a CEO, Ira Rennert, who in his private, um, you know, he, has, he has, owns many, many homes and so on, so, you know, his emission and, and airplanes and so on. You know, when you think about somebody like that versus, you know, that there's several billion people in the world who are earning, you know, less than $2 a day and, you know, with almost, you know, zero emissions, it's, it's, it's such an unequal responsibility, you know, for, for reducing. But he also gives the example of this person, the CEO, who in his dealings, um, I, I, he, uh, I, but he, he, it's not mining, I can't remember what he does, but you know that in his, in his position as a CEO, his emissions are, are many, many times higher than just being considered as a private citizen. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, again, essential to look at what the geopolitical picture is. Um, I totally agree with the urgency of the redistribution of wealth. But then I have a question on what most politicians, what most economists, and everybody maybe in the, in the public ones, that continuous growth. Mm -hmm. And I think we are on a global scale at the limit of what the globe can digest. And so uh, eventually, even after redistribution, I think the economy has to go down. We cannot keep growing all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to find a new kind of economy. Like I was, I was told that the service economy could could do could do better because um, not everybody needs to drill, right? So if you hire a handyman, he can service several houses. I mean, there are opportunities for more sustainable growth. Or neighbor share yeah. tools. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you have to look where the emissions are coming from, certainly the military is one. Sounds like we've <laughs> got some silence here. Any last call? I'll put another one on the table. All right. Ecoside. We have corporations that will knowingly sell you and your family tobacco. They've, they've murdered, they profited from murdering millions of our fellow citizens. There are corporations who are committing large scale, long term destruction of our environment. Was the plundering of the cod an act of ecocide? Was, is destroying the Amazon an act of ecocide? There's a proposal to have large-scale environmental destruction prosecuted criminally. We have, the, we have Interpol calling for larger prosecution of those committing illegal logging. We have to figure out that they are capable. Their political and corporate leaders are capable of failing to address threats to our future. And we have to figure out how we're going to deal with those who act with negligence. Well, thank you all, and I uh, certainly thank Danny. It's just. How could something like this be wonderful? But it, it, yeah. <laughs> it's very important and very good of you to do it for us, and I really am grateful. Thanks so much.